I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Dale Bingham. I'm the Visitor Services Coordinator for the Shumash Indian Museum in Thousand Oaks. I've had the pleasure of coordinating and planning the Museum Speaker Series program for the last few years now. Uh, this year has been very different <laughs> than ones in the past. Um, we had a lot of challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and us being a small museum, we um, have faced, you know, some larger challenges. In March, we completely closed our doors to the public and we postponed all of our planned events for the year. And we kind of had to rethink how we would go about engaging with the public um, in this new virtual climate. So we were very, very incredibly lucky to receive a CARE grant through the National Endowment for the Humanities that helped us fund our new virtual program, um, both our educational school tour programs, as well as this one, our speaker series. So tonight's presentation was funded through the CARE grant, um, and we will be offering one more virtual presentation in December through this grant. So be on the lookout through our social media website and email newsletters for those flyers and information on how to RSVP. After December, we would like to continue to bring these important topics and voices to all who are interested through our speaker series program. Unfortunately, due to funding issues brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic and the museum's closure, um, we're struggling to find the funds to continue with our speaker series events for the new year. That's why small donations from you guys are so important and they really mean the world to us. Even something as small as a $5 donation can really help us raise the funds to continue this program and book more speakers. Supporting our um, museum online gift shop is also a great way to help us raise those funds. So if you're considering purchasing a book, card, mask, t-shirt, um, we have a bunch of other items in our gift shop and it's all online now. Um, and we'll also have a holiday gift bundles coming up in the next week or so, so keep an eye out. Um, I'm gonna post the donation information in the chat and Q&A box below. Um, and then all of this information can also be found on our website at shumashmuseum.org. And now on to tonight's presentation. For all of you tuning in, we will have a Q&A session after her presentation. So as we continue, please feel free to submit your questions or comments. If you're using Zoom, please type your questions into the box. Um, and if you're joining us via Facebook Live, please feel free to comment and we will make sure that those comments make their way onto our Zoom box for her to see. Um, and now for our speaker, we at the museum are very excited to have Mara Sullivan joining us tonight. Mara is a Shumash language activist from the Coastal Band of the Shumash Nation. She began her language journey in 2010 and has since spent her time researching the language both online and in the archives in Washington, DC. Today, she's currently a graduate student in linguistics at Tulane University. And before I talk too much about her work, I'll go ahead and hand it over to her. No, no, Kajinaline, thank you a lot. Klekin, Shishilop, Kaktimola, Kupa, Ush ich ish, kiti papuil hi ki aklu, hi shmuich e liya aklu, hi ki kuhku, hi kuhku, she amuich, shmuich. So um, thank you so much. I was just starting out to say thank you and then kind of went into a little bit about, you know, what we're going to talk about and you know, saying thank you and saying my name and where I live. And um, my name is Maura Sullivan. I'm uh, Chumash, Irish, Mexicana nations. And so you can see that with my name, Sullivan. Um, so I'm proud, I'm proud to represent all those different peoples and a lot of people in my community, Coastal Band, you know, and Chumash were mixed people. And so I just wanted to start by honoring that, my different um, lineages, which you can see in my name. Um, so this is just kind of my first slide to kind of introduce um, who I am and the work I do. And I'm, you know, very grateful for the Chumash Indian Museum to reach out to me. And um, we actually got in touch um, right around the beginning of quarantine um, in COVID um, where my friend and I released four of our coloring book pages. So I'm excited to share that with, with everybody. Um, that links on the Indian Museum website. Um, that was kind of a, a gift that we wanted to give um, to 
the greater you know Chumash and non-native community um, at this time during COVID. So something for kids to to color and so people could see you know we have a language. You know, a lot of the work I do is just around visibility, like as um, Chumash people, as California Indian people, as Native American people in, you know, what is now the United States. Um, so I'm excited today, you know, I can see my, a couple friends and family in the Zoom. So some people know a little bit about who we are and I'm kind of, this presentation will kind of, um, there'll be a spectrum of just people who are just learning about Chumash people, culture and languages to folks, you know, other Chumash people logged on here. So I wanted to acknowledge, um, yeah, my friends and family that are out there watching, especially the youth, you know, you guys really inspire me. I know that sounds funny because like I'm a young person, um, but there are the younger people, even younger. And um, I just, the work I do you know, it is for you guys. And so it's for the elders too, but it's for the young people. So just wanted to, to give a shout out. And then I put my handle there for Instagram. I'm trying to use that more just as a platform to share about who we are as a people and the different struggles that we have. Um, but in my, you know, my day job, I'm a linguist. So um, let's see if I can, okay. I think I can do that, maybe. Not sure if I lost, feel free to interrupt me if I lost my video, um, Dale. Sorry, fumbling with technology. Okay, well, I'm gonna move this if you can see my screen. I just wanted to share this. Um, this is a map I made. This is really stepping away from and challenging like the colonial narrative about the way we perceive our land and our water. A lot of maps that we see, they still reference um, the Spanish colonial missions. They still, um, you know, reference town names, colonial American town names. Um, so this is an ongoing project that I'm working on to really just um, show our territories as Chumash people um, and especially reinforcing, you know, our original place names. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about that, like making sure to do that, like in a safe way um, that protects, you know, sensitive sites, burial sites, that kind of stuff. So this is where we are, Shishilop. And our territory goes all the way down to Humaliwu, where our neighbors are the Tongva. Tongva actually had their own name for Humaliwu, which was Humaliwungna. Um, and I think at this time too, I just want to acknowledge, um, acknowledge our neighbors, the Tongva. Um, they had a loss in their community. So I really think it's important for us to, you know, take those moments um, to acknowledge when we lose our elders, you know, that impact, we lose a lot. And so, um, Shumawish, Atipa Shumawish, sending a prayer to um, the Tongva people. Um, and kind of the north here are Sipakhtu uh, all the way to the north and then up here into the inlands. And I made this boundary really kind of fluid, almost like watercolor to really just, you know, I've been doing a lot of work up here in Pine Mountain and, and looking at, um, you know, our, our ancestral trade routes and in and, and that connection with our border, um, quote unquote border, because borders, you know, those are imaginary. You know, in ancient, in ancestral times, our people were intermarrying, our people were traveling. Um, and even by Humaliwu having two names, uh, Humaliwungna and Humaliwu, you know, you see that in the language that um, that was a shared area and that it was, you know, it had two names. So, and then down here at the bottom, we see Wheatma and Limu, those are our islands. So for those who live in this area, you probably, this is kind of fun for you to kind of see um, and not see English on here at all and not and just kind of see the, the village names. So I really wanted to start with that mm, to kind of give a moment to reorient and center. Um, okay. I see the chat going, I'm just gonna ignore it. Um, <laughs> um, thank you though, I appreciate that. Um, 
yeah, I want to keep somebody said thank you or somebody said nice map. So um, let's see. Not sure if this is in the way. There's a way to do that. Just struggling. Sorry. Okay. Um, this is another graphic I imagined kind of dreamed up recently when I was walking my dog just I like to really use walks to kind of dream and think and really um, allow myself to think on the work I'm doing and so looking at this presentation I wanted to offer everyone this visual to really show you know when we see or we hear these numbers about um, indigenous occupation and, and place here in California, we, we see these numbers, you know, 13,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, 30,000, these different numbers. And I wanted to emphasize, you know, part of, you know, kiaklu, that means our language. And then time immemorial, that's a phrase a lot of us use. And it really acknowledges what you see on that side. It, it shows animals and plants and food and that is a space that indigenous peoples use to, we say time immemorial. And I think it's a really beautiful way to say, we don't know how long it's, and so for a lot of us, it becomes kind of a beautiful space of just honoring, you know, our ancestors and, and the thousands of years they lived along these shores. You see the ocean there in the background, this beautiful, um, beautiful, part of our lives as coastal people. Um, so I just wanted to present this to, to folks out there to show, you know, Spanish coming here in the 1540s and then permanently through settler colonialism in the 1750s and then English during the American period. I said 1800s, but it's, you know, exact date, I guess 1840s, but I just wanted to show, and then through that time, you see at the bottom, like our language was still being spoken. So we're really through all this for thousands of years. And then through this time, which is very a brief time, you know, um, it's really, sorry. <laughs> um, it's really only a brief time in our, um, in our existence as a community, as Chumash people. So I'm really excited to share this. I shared this with some friends and family that do the language. And um, this was really exciting to kind of create a visual to tell, you know, a lot of people are also visual learners. That's something that, you know, as a community who's doing revitalization, how, what are people's different um, learning styles? So I'm excited to, to share this with more people. Um, a little bit more about who I am. I'm from a tribe called Coastal Band of the Chumash Nation. So there's multiple Chumash tribes. Um, so we're a small tribe. If you can see this map here, Southern California. Um, we do not have federal recognition. So we are still seeking that. And we have active community revitalization. So that includes the language, the culture. And then I was born and raised in Helo, which is Galita. And I'm considered an L2 speaker of Chumash. So that's a term we use in linguistics. And L1 is um, your first language and then L2 language two. So yeah, I'm an L2 of Chumash. Might be L3 because I speak Spanish too, but. Um, and I consider myself intermediate. I think that's an interesting point within language revitalization. Um, there's always like, well, that person speaks better than me. And so this is all kind of, I'm sharing some stuff more about kind of like language ideologies and like the stuff that goes along with revitalization. Um, and there are no speakers in my family. So the last speaker, um, very many generations ago, I think I can pinpoint probably when, but definitely around that Spanish and American era. Um, but I've been doing cultural and language revitalization since 2008 when I was um, first introduced to being a paddler in the Tomo. So shout out to all my paddlers on the call. Um, it really made me strong. It made my heart and my spirit really strong. So I'll always be grateful 
um, for the Tomol. And then kind of a wider context, um, the abstract for this talk, I really wanted to kind of share with people like this is actually a national and international movement that the Chumash people are part of with our language revitalization um, from archival material. So some of the other people that are very famous in this movement um, here, this is a screenshot from Miami or Miami University, the Miami Center. So they actually have a partnership with that university. Um, I was part of this program, the National Breath of Life program. And so they're doing a lot of the same work we are. They have, um, they have archival material. Um, so I just love um, when I do get to, excuse me, cross paths with Daryl Baldwin and folks, um, Dr. Wesley Leonard, people from the Miami community because they're really doing a lot of um, the work that we're doing. So it's beautiful to kind of see the way our communities um, have interacted over the years. And then I also included um, Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival. That acronym is ICLES. Um, and they have also been very instrumental in supporting through the Master Apprentice Program and other programs, um, again, California tribes that do archival work and revitalization work, um, and also just other tribes as well, like if tribes still have elder speakers. So these are all ways to kind of, when you get into language revitalization, ways to categorize or kind of talk about communities. So Chumash, we have no elder speakers. Um, Miamia, no elder speakers. And then the last example over here, which is very famous as well, we still live here. Um, and this is the story of Jessie Little Doe Baird. Um, and I actually got to meet her this year. And it was so heartwarming because she was just right away, she's like, tell me about your community. What are you doing? And it was just really exciting because she's really a rock star um, in the revitalization community. So again, Wampanoag was not spoken in Martha's Vineyard. Um, for over 200 years, and they did revitalization with um, biblical material. So anything you can say in the Bible, they had in Wampanoag. So that was one of the first books printed in the quote unquote new world. Um, and so the Wampanoag really did the work to like, you know, extract or, you know, work with their, I don't want to say extract, but like get, you know, get that data out from the archive, rework it, um, they have a school, you know, there. So again, these are different people. This is kind of the larger movement that we as Shmuich um, and Chumash people um, are part of. And then the final one up there, TLC Language Conservancy, one of my mentors, Willem DeRoos, he works for them with Apache. Um, so there's also people, obviously people who have speakers and their speakers, you know, right now, especially someone just sent me a link about the impacts of COVID on native communities, like losing our elders, again, acknowledging the, um, you know, that the elders carry our stories and they're, they're very um, central to also just, you know, encouraging us and taking care of us. And, you know, conversations I had with an elder this weekend, it really made me proud, you know, the work I do for us as a linguist, um, cause that can kind of be an uncomfortable title to take on sometimes because linguistics as a discipline has been very extractive. Um, the fact that I'm a native woman in linguistics, um, it's a very small number of us. Um, so Jessie Little Doe definitely, um, she got her MA from MIT and her daughter's in the program too. So hard shift, sorry, <laughs> but um, you know, further going into some of these ideas about linguistics, languages, dialects. Um, this is a big question is like, you know, is it a language or a dialect? So we only really have documented one dialect, which is Kasil, which is up north, which would that be, be like a dialect of Shmuich? But for the most part, we have almost nine Chumash languages. Um, I have another map that I'll show in a moment, but really a language is a specific, it's almost a political designation. So across the world, um, you have all these different languages. And if 
as a language family, Chumash is an isolate. So it's not related to any languages around it. And so we are, we are a language family. Um, I will come back to this. I wanted to show this map. Um, so this is the language family. Um, again, this is a term that linguists use to talk about languages that are closely related or mutually intelligible, meaning understood within each other. And I think what I've kind of heard from people is like within Chumash, you know, the Southern, these are all using the, um, the missionized names. And so that's something we're moving away from. Like, so we say Shmuich for Barbareño because that means coastal. Um, so these are all the mission names and we're really moving away from those because it just, um, it's a way to kind of honor our ancestors, right? It's like, well, we're not gonna use these names that were forced on us, um, but these are still technically used within linguistics. So it's good, at least for me to know them. Um, and within like, so Ventureño and Barbareño are next to each other. And then Ineseño, which is the North. So they say that actually Ineseño and Barbareño are the most too closely related. Um, and so they're all sisters. This is another term we use in linguistics. This is a language family and their language sisters, um, but within them you'll have variation. And so that's why they're considered their own languages. So we don't actually say dialect. Um, some people maybe who don't understand those differences will use, will say like, oh, how many dialects? But um, it's kind of to show like a res respect for the fact that actually these were separate languages. Um, historically. And so I know the other slide I said nine, I think five to six. I mean, it's hard to kind of, I was trying to count that dialect. Uh, and then the islands, Wheatma, which is Santa Rosa and Limu, Santa Cruz, they have their own languages too. So we have less evidence, like we have less documentation of those. The most documentation we have is from the mainland languages. And I would say there's serious revitalization in four. And like I said, because of the documentation, there's less, you know, it's cool to kind of pull words out from the um, Ayet La Limu, the, the island people, but um, there's not as much documentation. And we have several communities working on Santa Barbara language as well as the Ventura language. And then an endonym, so there's endonym and exonym. An endonym means that the name you call yourself, an exonym is what other people call you. So our endonym is Shmuich, and it means one from the coast. And again, we have no elder speakers, and, but we've done a lot over the last 10, 15 years with Breath of Life. We've had several of our um, community members do the Breath of Life program. Just fumbling with my slides. Okay, kind of want to go back to this. Move my camera. I don't know where my camera is, but um, yes, this is a picture from Nip Nipolomol Hipoten Poten Ki Nipolomol Ki Akshwalahi Nip Nipolomol. This is our mountain. Pine Mountain. So I know a lot of people signed up for the webinar through Pine Mountain. So thank you so much for um, following the newsletter over here. Um, and this is snow. So there's snow up on Pine Mountain right now. And I asked a few people, you know, what, what did they want me to share tonight? Um, and that's really important for me, like, it takes a lot to like come out here into the public, even though it's just Zoom, but, um, and yeah, I wanted to make sure I was representing, you know, friends and family and what they, you know, the story of what we're, we're doing as a community. And one of the things um, that was shared with me is like the importance of songs and singing. So I opened with the song a little bit um, and I'll do a little demo of my one sock. One sock is our traditional clapstick hollowed out um, instrument. And uh, 
the way I learned a lot of the language was through songs, through going to Limu, through paddling. Um, and it's really important looking back now because when you're learning a song, that's called immersion. You're learning, your body's in it, your heart is in it, and you're learning and you're just singing. Um, and, you know, I want to acknowledge my teacher, Deborah Sanchez, and her family, Georgie, Uncle Johnny, Auntie Mena, like just really that spirit of community that we all have on Limu, which is our island here, Santa Cruz Island. Um, really created a, a space to learn those songs and share songs. And I've written my own songs now. Um, so really the importance of using our songs as well as also old songs. So we're also bringing these old songs. Um, you know, our aunties and things did this work to bring these songs out for us. So our generation has been really lucky um, and even I'm kind of like straddling that because like when I first went to Berkeley and was looking at archival material, we were still using the microfilm reels. Um, and so now everything's online or digital, but I still have that, you know, feeling of like looking through the slides. And so that was the way that our, our community was really bringing out this archival material as well as sound recordings. And that is through the work of JP Harrington and the Smithsonian. Um, and these are called wax cylinder recordings. So those old songs, you know, really inspired a lot of us to, I think, yeah, create these new songs. Um, and we were already creating songs too. So that's been a really big part of our um, community revitalization. I see, um, I'll just sing and write songs that I never really record down. They're just in that moment. So it's almost become like, a form of prayer um, for me as well. I think I kind of touched on this a little bit, um, but I really wanted to share, this is a big issue, language protocols and intellectual property. So really thinking about the idea, um, you know, I have here apps like Rosetta Stone, feelings of privacy and protecting language from becoming exploited by outsiders and the work that community language workers dedicate. Um, I wanted to just touch a little bit and share about, you know, all those people I talked about, Massachusetts, um, Oklahoma, Arizona, you know, language revitalization and language work in what is now the US and Canada. Um, it has a lot of these intricate, um, issues. So apps like Rosetta Stone, you know, yeah, it's 2020. Let's get an app. Let's do this. Let's do that. Well, really slowing down and seeing, you know, where your community's at with that, because some people, some tribes and communities have been able to say no, and it's, they're guarded about their material. And it's because it's, especially for us, if somebody created an app where people could learn Chumash, and then our own community is still struggling and learning Chumash, that would be really hurtful. So, you know, when we share our culture or we share um, our story, you know, I was excited to share with, with the public, but it's also complicated. It's, it's a story that, and other native people, you know, might disagree or agree with me out there, but I guess I'm just trying to share like things that I've seen in conversations I've had with people. Um, and so how can we use online platforms and technology, but also, you know, protect our communities? Um, and because, yeah, the work we do is a lot. It's not just, um, you know, the community language worker that runs the school and works and teaches the classes. Um, they take that work home with them too. It's, it's, very, um, it's very personal work to do this. Um, so definitely protocols around language um, and intellectual property is a big um, thing I'm very interested and passionate about within linguistics. Sorry to have go back and forth. Um, 
Yeah, I think finally kind of wrapping up, I want to share again about the coloring book that I worked on um, with my community. We're still working on it. And the Mellon Fellowship that I'm part of um, through Tulane. So this is about community engaged scholarship. It's about working with your community. So yes, like I am an academic, I am in a linguistics program, but I'm also a community member. And so this Mellon Fellowship is a certificate in community engaged scholarship. It was, I was part of one of the first groups to do it at Tulane and which is in unceded homelands of Chittimacha, Choctaw, Atakvishak, Homa, um, Tunicobaleksi. Um, many, many tribes live in what is now New Orleans. Um, so I've been there the last two years. Um, and so this program I'm part of, my initial proposal was to do a textbook, but the community responded, you know, let's actually do a coloring book. So this has been part of the work I've been doing the last two years, using this funding to hire community artists and language students, some of who are on this call. And thank you for sending me your dialogues for me to look at. <laughs> um, so it's been really exciting too, as a community, like me going down this path, I was able to kind of be an example and also um, advise some of the youth too about linguistics again because it is a very white male dominated space like people of color in linguistics and BIPOC indigenous people um, we are very few in linguistics so um, Mellon Fellowship also allowed me to meet other scholars doing similar work um, and so through this program, I reached out, sorry to spoil that slide, um, to my friend, artist Solange Aguilar. She's an Argonaut. This is some of the samples of their work. They're a BIPOC artist up here in Siochtun. Um, and so, yeah, they produced this really great work. So I was like, let's team up. Um, so check their work out. And so this is what we created. Um, so this is on the Chumash Indian museum website please feel free to download them um, eventually we will create a book um, and then yeah that'll have to be discussed within the community like do we want to just give those away do we want to sell them um, not everything has to be you know mass produced and put online and so that's really hard for us like this society that we live in it's hard to like have that um, take that thought and take that care around the stuff you produce um, but it's very nice to have those conversations and, um, feel like we're, you know, respecting people's input about how they feel about, you know, wanting to, um, protect the language. So this is Atwai, Akhiwo, and Siliamsh. And so Atwai is moon, Akhiwo is star, and Siliamsh is full moon. So these are just beautiful. Um, it really, when you color them, it takes a long time and you're like interacting with the word. Um, so I'm really into like, you know, trying to find those activities um, to increase language use among our adults and our youth. So there was that craze there for a while where folks were doing the coloring books, the adult coloring books. So kind of trying to play on that. This is, E is for Eneke Yeye, Elewese, E Lelespu. That one's hard. E Lelespu. Again, so beautiful. Solange is an amazing artist. So we're really having fun creating these. Um, I really look forward to, you know, the rest of them. This one is E. So we pronounce this E. E is for Iloch, Iloch. Is hook to wear bangs, which is like a verb, which is like my favorite verb ever. Um, ekmai, ekmai. Um, yeah, one of the things that we saw in the archival material was that um, one of the elders that was interviewed, he talked about bangs was a traditional hairstyle for um, Chumash women. 
So I love wearing bangs. I grow them out sometimes, but then I like cutting them again. And especially once I get an Epsu, it's going to be very cute. But um, yeah, Ishok is a super cool word, Ishok. Um, finally, I just wanted to share a little bit of what the archive material looks like. Um, I guess I still have a little bit of time. Um, so this is the Harrington material. This is his handwriting. Um, I was talking to a friend on the phone, like I wanted to make sure I picked something that was like, you know, kind of neutral. This is, you know, one of the issues with archival material is like, you know, the elders talked to these linguists, anthropologists, 100 years ago, this was work that was done, like 1914. Um, and it covers a vast array of cultural and spiritual um, and some, some, you know, considered taboo material. So you have to be really careful. This is an issue um, that has been seen in other communities where a linguist who just comes in with like blinders on, which is like, oh, I'm just here to find data or like bring out example sentences. Um, you have to have that community input because if you bring something out and it comes out into the dictionary or the textbook, and then you have, let's say, young kids or community members saying example sentences that are maybe not for them. Um, and by that, I mean, maybe the linguist pulled out, I think a famous example is like a ceremonial, like a prayer. Um, which happened in a tribe in the Southwest. A linguist pulled out um, a, a sentence, brought it out to be in the textbook, and then you know, it became a really big issue. They were asked to leave because of this uh, misuse of, or you know, they didn't really know, but it's like, so being a Chumash linguist and also being able to speak Spanish, you know, you you see here on this slide, the top says, Tut, then it says sp, and that means Spanish. And then, so this was an animal. Like I said, I tried to find something that was like fairly innocuous to be able to just share so people could see like this is the material that we work with. Um, and this looks terrifying. It's called a rock tarantula. I don't know what that is, <laughs> but um, it says the word again, katut. Um, literally, oh yeah, hup is rock. So uh, literally rock tarantula. Um, so this was in a, in a section about um, animals. And um, I wanted to just show this to show, you know, <clears throat> not only the knowledge of learning how to read this handwriting. So this is Harrington's and some of the stuff is typewritten, but a lot of it is this kind of cursive. Um, and then that other piece of like being able to know Spanish. So some folks don't really know Spanish anymore. So I went, I learned Spanish. Um, my grandma's Mexicana, I learned Spanish to talk with her. Um, and then, yeah, being able to kind of add that cultural lens to like, getting to know this material and getting to know like, okay, if I did come across a sentence that was not something to be brought out into the textbook, you know, I can help make those decisions. Um, so the work I'm doing, um, it's really, it's really special and, and I'm grateful to be on this path. Um, and yeah, I'm grateful to kind of, I update people or kind of show people the work I do, but it was, exciting to kind of consolidate it all and present it here. Uh, yeah, so you can see how this gets really, I'm trying not to stay too long on this one because it's pretty cool, but um, you can kind of see the, the cursive. I think that's about all I wanted to talk about. Um, This is an ongoing project with Mellon. I'm also really grateful to be in that because um, having the community engaged scholarship lens, like, so this talk I'm doing right now, this is considered public scholarship. So I'm presenting to the public. Um, you may or may not be academics. You may or not may not be linguists, 
Um, and so oftentimes public scholarship will happen like at a museum or a library and like you, this is a way to like share your work. Whereas community engaged scholarship is a term that we're talking about where communities are part of your actual uh, research plan development. So you have all these steps along the way, like I proposed this to, to our community language program in um, winter of 2018. I said, do you guys wanna have a textbook? And then we went back and forth. We said, well, let's do a coloring book. And then today I was even talking to someone about like, how could we make those books that are like, they're really hard, like cardboard. So like for little babies, like, so they won't tear the pages. <laughs> um, so that back and forth and kind of talking about the work we do with the community where now I took their lead on, okay, let's do a coloring book. Um, that's community engaged scholarship. So those are kind of just the big buzzwords um, in the program that I'm in at Tulane. Um, and I wanted to just kind of make sure to like give a little space to that too, because it's important for linguists. Like I said, like it's very extractive, very male dominated, like very white space. And so as people from these communities whose languages have been overstudied, I would say, um, it's important for us to be in these positions now to do this work, to start, you know, making these decisions so we, we can be our own linguists. Um, so I think that's about it. I will go maybe to this slide and yeah, I'm not sure. I guess I can stop the screen. We can start with questions if you're ready. I've seen a, a few come into the chat box. Um, someone mentioned that pulp or pulpo could be octopus. Is rock tarantula Ooh, cool. octopus? Thank you, Spanish speaker. <laughs> Let me just go back to these. I can't really see how to go back. Okay, cool. Somebody said they heard the song so I could I can sing another one. Uh, somebody said Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to read all the questions, but um, here's an interesting one. How far is it possible to go with language revitalization? Do we have enough historical resources to enable speakers to reach a good level of fluency? Um, my mom said, could it be an octopus? <laughs> so that was cool. Um, yeah, Jeff Odell asks about language revitalization. Do we have enough? Uh, we do, as Chumash people, um, when I was in New Orleans, that was definitely an issue due to their history uh, in the South, um, absolute genocide on Andrew Jackson's part and the destruction of the South. Some of those languages aren't documented. And so that was really hard for me as somebody who's like excited about language revitalization I would like oftentimes like, hey, like what's up with your language? And it's like, oh, like our heritage language is French. So a lot of people like identify with French as one of their heritage languages um, because they don't really have documentation. Um, and so how far is it possible to go? I mean, you know, right now, as we're building up our language speaking community, and then that next generation. So like, I really have a lot of hope for like my children's generation. I have a lot of hope for like, me and my friends and my aunties and everybody too. But like, that next generation, like we will have those resources. Um, my other friend wanted to, I said, what do you want me to share tonight? And really talking about the connection between our language and our land as well. Um, the picture I showed of Pine Mountain. Um, when we speak our language, kiti papuil, he ki aklu, he ki shup, he ki ush ich ish, e ki cho, no no cho, hulapshan. 
you know, when we speak our language with our land, it's good medicine for us. Um, so as landless people, um, Chumash people, we are actively trying to rematriate our land, get our land back, create land bases. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping to launch a website. I'll probably use my at Bruja Scholar. Um, so folks can keep track of me on there or on, on Instagram um, as we continue to just strengthen our culture and strengthen our communities. Um, I see some other things about people growing up here. And I think too, as Chumash people, like the history we were taught in school, you know, a lot of us did mission projects too. You know, for those that don't know, the mission project was, um, you know, and I, I honestly don't really like to talk about the mission. So you didn't see that in my project or my presentation here, but you know, the, the for those that don't know, the missions were absolutely um, devastating um, genocide by the Spanish people, Spanish army and um, religion that um, forced our people into um, forced labor and um, destroyed our way of life, really tried to destroy our people. And they did in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways too, we persevered. Um, the fact that we still had speakers, the last speaker of Chumash died in 65. I think that's a testament to, and that was really meant to be so that our generations could, you know, take that on and speak the language again so the land could hear us again. Um, cool, I'm seeing people here talking about reconnecting as Chumash. Um, I'm from Coastal Band of the Chumash Nation, so that's, you could email us if you have questions. Um, Somebody said they took their kids out of school when they taught missions in Gold Rush. A long-term dream of mine is to create our own school. A lot of our kids do face bullying in the schools for having long hair um, or yeah, talking about being, you know, being proud to be Chumash and they're told that they're liars, you know? And so that's like, wow, that's trauma that's happening right now in the, you know, in the last 20 years um, that I think we could stop by creating our own whether that be a charter school like the Wampanoag people do or different ways, alternative, you know, especially now um, with COVID, right? I think a lot of people are trying to rethink schooling. Um, and I see some other things about suggestions for Mitzchanakotan language or learning in general. Um, yeah, I think that's another thing I'm interested in doing is um, kind of being like a consultant. Like I've met a lot of people through this work and I know a lot of techniques and I've actually, um, I'll share one more thing with you guys. Um, this is a website I just started, Native Language Net. Okay. So I'll put this in the chat box. I just started this site with uh, like five other community language workers and um, I'll just show it too, but looks like Q&A also has questions. Okay, cool. I'll go over there in a minute. Um, chat. Well, thanks everyone for joining. This has been super cool. I'm glad it pushed me out of, I was like really scared. Um, I'm glad people said they refused to do the mission project. We have a few questions on our Facebook as well. Somebody oh, cool. asked if you studied Peabody's archives and if so, do you feel his interpretation of it was correct? And do you study with the reservation in San Inez's language program? Yeah, so those are great questions. Um, my slide at the beginning, I'm from Coastal Band of the Chumash Nation. I also said there's probably like nine different, you know, political groups as Chumash people. So like we're all Chumash, but then within that we use different political designations to organize, you know, within what is the colonial structure now. Um, so roundabout answer, no, I do not work with the Tamala Chumash. I have friends that do Somala 
um, but I'm we're our own language program, the Shmuelich Community Language Program. Um, so this is an event I'm putting on. You guys can check this out. I'm starting to grow this. Um, I don't know how to scroll down. Okay, January 9th, we're gonna have, so me and like four other uh, community language activists, we got together, we decided, hey, this is really hard work. And those conferences we go to, that spark of joy we get when we meet with other language workers, like we need to take advantage of Zoom and we need to um, put together some space for us to support each other right now. So I made this flyer, I'm very proud. Um, and yeah, this idea, I just kind of created this idea like language as indigenous survivance. So like teaching online right now during a pandemic, what is that like? So these are all community language workers, Potawatomi, Shawnee, Osage, Kiowa. Just wanted to like- see your screen, Mara. What's that? We can't see your screen. Oh, I thought I'm sharing. It's just a white screen. I don't know if there, if you go back to share screen, does it allow you to talk? toggle between them. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, sorry. Thank you for <laughs> Let Yeah, let me know if it does that again. Um, so yeah, this is a website I shared in the chat. It's just, what is the URL? I just made it. Um, yeah, Tima is part of Coastal Band. Sorry, there's a question in the chat. Um, so this site is Native Language Net. So yeah, I'm really proud of this. Like we just put this together in the last month and it's actually really been exciting for me. Like I created this flyer, can you see it? Yes. And so like doing art, I really like doing digital art. Um, we, I created this blog section, just some thoughts about going like teaching online. Um, and the other question you had one of them was about Samala and then what was, oh, the Harrington. Yeah, so that was the sample of work I showed, the really intricate handwriting. So that's the Harrington Peabody. It was John Peabody Harrington. Um, Someone asked, how can we support you and the work you're doing? Um, I don't know, I guess. I mean, if you're online, follow my Instagram. I put the name on there, Bruja Scholar. Um, definitely somebody said greetings from Mexico. Thank you. Um, that's about it though. I mean, there's, yeah. And then maybe share what I do or, but I don't know. I think right now for native American heritage month, like supporting me can also look like supporting, you know, native food banks or supporting, um, you know, sharing something or talking about native, um, issues um, with your friends and family. Um, yeah, so those are some of the ways that maybe don't seem as obvious to like um, support me. I appreciate somebody said that. Just send me a good vibe. <laughs> um, but, and then uh, our tribe, Coastal Band, we have a website um, so people can check that out. We have a GoFundMe as well. So that's another way to support um, local indigenous people. What else is going on here? Somebody says, how can we learn our languages? Um, we don't really have a name that I've seen for Pine Mountain. Uh, I just said, uh, like these mountains, they have trees. Um, that's kind of another thing about learning Chumash is like, um, somebody said support Pine Mountain. Yes, thank you. Um, being able to kind of speak like Yoda, like I know it sounds funny, but it's like you kind of have to like, like we wouldn't say Pine Mountain, we would say that mountain, it has pine trees. So you flip things around um, and that's definitely a challenge for people who are L1 English. Like I said, L1 is your, um, your um, somebody, sorry, I'm distracted by the chat. L1 is in, like most of us are L1 English speakers. So trying to flip around and trying to do that even before you learn the Chumash words, I think is really important. Cause it's like, you actually have to learn, it's called grammar. Not like, oh, you use that word wrong, but like 
grammar in linguistics is a term that we use that's really the syntax and the ordering of a language. Um, and somebody's asking, I like Bruja linguist, but I'm Bruja scholar. <laughs> um, so if people want to follow me, and like I said, I think I'm going to start a website too, where maybe I can do some more of these talks and yeah, talk about more of the work we're doing, protecting Pine Mountain and other exciting Chumash news. So thank you so much. I think that's about it. If we want to do like another question. I guess I have a question. Sure. Where do you see your language in 20 years? Oh, wow. I like where <laughs> as like a physical place too. Um, I know in Montana, they have a lot of signs with their language. And I love that. I love driving. And I was like taking pictures being dangerous. Um, so where maybe physical, but also where like as speakers. Um, yeah, just a bunch more. Um, I see my friends shouted out fluent. So more people speaking the language every day like yeah at the store like you know really reclaiming um our spaces um to speak our language with each other um more um yeah more children's programs um what inspired me um i was invited to go to breath of life and i and i didn't know you know, what um, Breath of Life was an archival institute at Berkeley. So it was like 10 years ago. So I've actually been doing this work for 10 years, um, 33 now, and I started at 23. So um, then I wanted to pray. And I hear my friends say that too, you know, they want to learn our language so they can pray. So I, that feels good to me that we're all really um, trying to use our language um, in a spiritual way, but also, yeah, use our language to talk about um, the, the everyday things, you know, eating and drinking and all these things. And someone says land back, thank you. That's how you can help us too. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for giving me space, I hope you know, we can get another um, different experts from our community and just hear more stories. Um, hope you guys get some more funding so you can keep bringing folks on here. Um, and I'll just finish with a song. The, one of the ancestor songs that um, my auntie Deb wrote. Nali, not no li yakuku, um, ki osh ich ish, he, ki, uh, huku, he, nah, nahalamuuk, e nip nipolomo ol. Um, we're very happy and we are the people of the mountains and the, and the islands. Um, so thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you again so much for joining us. <laughs> I'm glad it's easier via virtual. Um, that we were able to have so many people on here. For everyone wondering how you can watch this, as soon as I click end, it will be available on Facebook Live. So you can start it from the beginning on Facebook Live um, if you wanna see it right away, or you can wait a few days and we'll have it up on our YouTube channel as well. So our YouTube channel, you can search Shumash Indian Museum and it should pop up. You'll see our logo with the swordfish there. Um, and then you can hop on our website and you can join our email list if you aren't already on it. Um, and then we'll send you out an email when we have new events coming out. So 
Thank you again, everyone, for tuning in. And thank you again, Mara, for joining us. Um, we will be in touch. Feel free to reach out whenever you have anything new you want to share. Um, we'd love to share it on our social media as well as our website and help you out with that. So, Alrighty, have a good night, everyone. Thank you.